Hello again everyone, Mary Rose here. Welcome to Stitch Bliss Corner. I have a poem today for Jonna, the stitching scientist, and her new baby, Louie. <laughs> and uh, there is a reference in, in the poem that I'm going to read to you of Kanga and Roo, but it isn't an Australian poet. I think it's a reference to the Kanga and Roo of the Winnie the Pooh books at the time uh, by Milne, A.A. A. Milne. So I'm going to read that for her because I was going to do it last video but I went right out of my head. So I promised that I would read it to her first up uh, this time. Uh, and the rest of this video is going to be all about Margaret Beaufort and the White Queen Elizabeth Woodville and Richard III is quite heavily represented as well which was unexpected to me I didn't really expect him to rate uh, so much in this even though of course he's a big part of it but then there are quite a few of other characters in this period of history who also rate quite highly but I'll get round to that um, by the end of this video you will know what the words from Shakespeare mean. There are two quotes that I've, I've uh, highlighted. One is the words of Richard III, which are, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer uh, by this son of York. That's one of my favorite uh, lines at all, even without knowing anything about it. I think it's fabulous. And the other one is, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, which is another uh, quote from Shakespeare that Richard, uh, his character, is saying. So both of those quotes you will know all about by the end of this video. Also, what has playing cards got to do with this period in history? You'll find out. Now, here is the poem that I promised. And it is by Ruth Holbert Hamilton. Now she was the mother of four children and she had a fifth child. And this is a poem for a fifth child. Um, she was born in Kirksville, Missouri in 1921, but lived most of her life in Oak Park, Park sorry, Illinois. This poem was first published in Ladies Home Journal, 1958. Um, and it's from the lullabylink.com. So, I shall read it to you now. For you, Jonna, and baby Louie. <laughs> and it says, there's another title for it called Babies Don't Keep. Um, and it says, Mother, oh mother, come shake out your cloth. Empty the dustpan, poison the moth. Hang out the washing, make up the bed. Sew on a button and butter the bread. Where is the mother whose house is so shocking? She's up in the nursery blissfully rocking. Oh, I've grown as shiftless as little boy blue. Lullaby, rockaby, lullaby loo. Dishes are waiting and bills are past due. Pat a cake, darling, and peek, peekaboo. The shopping's not done and there's nothing for stew. And out in the yard there's a hullabaloo. But I'm playing kanga and this is my roo. Look, aren't his eyes the most wonderful hue? Lullaby, rockaby, lullaby, loo. The cleaning and scrubbing can wait till tomorrow. But children grow up as I've learned to my sorrow. So quiet down, cobwebs, dust go to sleep. I'm rocking my baby, and babies don't keep. So, don't worry about things piling up and dust everywhere. You just cuddle your baby, that's what I say. Right, now on to this mammoth undertaking. Uh, and it was a case of where to start. And I decided to go into the family groups and then bring it all together if possible. So here goes my take on Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodville and other major characters of the medieval times in England. And I thought to start out, I would just show a map of England. 
uh, just to get the bearings because there are plenty of people around the globe that, you know, if they're watching this, they'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. So here's the map of England, well, Great Britain, England, Scotland, and Wales. Now, of course, England and Wales are what feature heavily in this particular piece. Now, we have... Uh, Wales is where uh, Margaret Beaufort's side come from. And up in this part of the world, up in the York area, is the Woodville side. And London is down there. So if you can just try and keep in your mind, Ludlow Castle comes in later um, and Milford Haven comes in. So I'll keep this map nearby and I might refer back to that. Okay. Now the other thing to do, I think, is to have a look at the different houses of uh, Lancaster and York. So there were two big houses, royal houses in England, and it's all because of this person here, this guy is King Edward III and he had 11 children and because he had all those children they were all very keen to claim the crown and that's where the trouble started because there ended up being two branches of his house and one branch was the branch of Lancaster which is this one and that is the side that Margaret Beaufort comes from and Henry Tudor's side. So we'll put that aside for the moment and we're going to concentrate on the House of York side which is the side of Elizabeth Woodville and through quite well the crown changed sides quite a lot between the two branches of the family. It was called the Wars of the Cousins because in some way or another they were all sort of related and they were always fighting for supremacy as to who was going to be king. So you'd have a Yorkist king and then he'd be over, uh, you know, the throne would be taken from him, from a Lancaster, and then he'd be there for a couple of years and then the York king would take it. And on and on it went for a for hundred years, really. I mean, it just didn't seem like it was ever going to stop. There was always one king from one side ready to, you know, that was deposed for the other side. So anyway, let's get back to this. So I'm going from, these are all descendants from this guy. Edward III, okay? So it's all come down now to Edward IV. There he is there, the Yorkist king. And he was a very tall king. I've got him here. There he is. That's Edward IV. Now he was a ladies' man, a playboy, and quite charismatic. And, you know, liked to dress nicely as well. Now, he had a brother, George Plantagenet. He was Duke of Clarence. And he was the second person to the king. And because he was the second person, he had vast lands, uh, more actually than the king did. But um, so he was quite ambitious and he sort of looks that way, doesn't he? He, he looks quite, uh, well, he's not a shrinking violet, put it that way. And then the third brother of Edward IV was Richard. And there he is there, the last Plantagenet king he ended up being. So he looks, they say that he used to fiddle with his rings a lot. He was a nervous person and he was always taking his dagger out of his, out of the sheath and putting it back again. So he, he just seemed like he was quite a, an edgy sort of person. So here they are here. You've got Edward IV there and then you've got George 
and Richard. There's the, uh, there's the three brothers, Edward, George and Richard. And of course, Edward uh, needed a wife. And his great advisor, like a foreign minister, was needed, well, up to his neck actually, in negotiations with France for a princess from France to marry him because they needed an alliance with France and they had connections with France. So what did this fellow do? This it's another picture of him, Edward do. He decided to fall in love with someone that was a, what they called a commoner. Who was, <clears throat> excuse me again, Elizabeth Woodville. And she was ab absolutely beautiful. She was considered to be the most beautiful person, a woman, in England. And she was first married to Sir John Grey, who died at the Second Battle of St Albans. And that left her a widow and a mother of two sons. And her second marriage was uh, caused a great deal of trouble to Ed, you know marrying Edward because she had I think it was 13 at least brothers and sisters and because they weren't royalty they were commoners they all came to court and Edward gave them all high-ranking positions and everything above all the Yorkist nobles who were furious about the whole thing and she wasn't a shrinking violet either she used to throw her weight about a fair bit and was um i think she was described as being quite grasping i think that was the um anyway edward was the uh, second king of england since the norman conquest to have married one of his subjects uh, <clears throat> excuse me so anyway she that caused trouble to you know and the trouble caused Clarence the second person to fancy his chances at being able to take the throne from Edward the fourth because as far as he was concerned what happened was when um, Edward the fourth met Elizabeth Woodville he wanted his way with her, but she was having none of it. Apparently she had a knife to defend herself with and insisted that they get married, which they did in secret at her father's house. Uh, but there was a rumour that he was already pre-contracted or already married, Edward, to someone else because this was his modus operandi. If he fancied a woman, he would secretly marry them, have his way, and then deny all knowledge of the, of the, the marriage. Um, so, and Clarence decided that he would take advantage of this and he would say that the marriage was not legitimate because they'd had, uh, how many children did they have? Well, they had the two princes and they had, um, oh, of course, they had um, Elizabeth, not Elizabeth Woodville, but her first daughter was called Elizabeth, and some other daughters. So they had a nice little family, Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. She did her duty by him. But, of course, Clarence was putting rumours about that it was an illegal union and the children were all illegitimate. Um, and he wanted to depose Edward because of that. Anyway, there was a carry-on and Clarence basically lost and was put on trial by Edward, who couldn't cope with it anymore, with him carrying on and causing insurrection. And he was put on trial by Edward IV and he was uh, executed in the end. Um, and Shakespeare has it that he was drowned in a vat of wine in the tower. <laughs> but I don't think that happened. I think he was probably knocked on the head or something happened to him. Um, I'm not quite sure about that one. I mean, this area of history is not, you know, 
it's difficult to get exactly what did happen. Most of it is sort of steeped in this kind of um, intrigue that you're not really quite sure. It's what most historians agree on, you know. So anyway, with Clarence gone, George, Duke of Clarence, um, all of his lands that he did have conveniently went to Edward IV. So he could, again, be disseminating all this land around the family of Elizabeth Woodville, or the Woodville family, um, which again didn't go down very well. So even though they were grudging and weren't happy, um, it all sort of carried on reasonably okay. But then Edward IV ended up going out on the Thames one day, getting some sort of illness, and he died. Now, before he died, Richard, where's this picture here? There he is. Richard had been absolutely lock, stock and barrel loyal to Edward IV. He was there when most of the things needed doing, you know, he was there for him. And he was born with that scoliosis in his spine. Um, but uh, he never let that get in his way. He was a great soldier, uh, especially on horseback, because that it made him the equal of anyone, they said, on the horseback. It was only when he was down on the ground fighting that he didn't have the same range of movement because of, of his spine. Um, but anyway, um, Edward had given this guy uh, uh, what's the word? administration of the north and everything and trusted him. Um, and, so, and he was very trustworthy until Edward died. And then Richard and Clarence was gone. Richard was in a very precarious position because once Edward IV died, there was a power vacuum. And Elizabeth Woodville and her relatives, naturally enough, wanted to control their son, the prince. I've got a picture of him here. Now, they had two sons. One was Edward and the other one was Richard. Edward was the oldest one. And of course, when Edward IV died, Edward V, his son, became king automatically. But he was only 12 years old. So, of course, Elizabeth Woodville was lobbying the council, the, the equivalent of the parliament at the time, to give her guardianship of her son. Now, the council was mostly made up of non-Woodvilles, you know, and all the Yorkist royals that had considered the Woodvilles to be upstarts right from the beginning. So they were very reluctant to actually do that. And Richard III said, well, look, why... Well, Richard, he wasn't the third then. But Richard said, look, I'll be Lord Protector. I'll swear fealty to him. And then, you know, look after the place until this guy gets to be 18. And the Parliament agreed to that and said, well, that, that sounds pretty good. So what happened was, um, this guy was in Ludlow, which is... The map I showed you before, just down. He was in Ludlow Castle when his father died. So then he, Elizabeth Woodville said, I want him to have an army to come back to London because she was in London there and she wanted a big army to escort her son back to London. And Richard said, no, you don't need, he doesn't need an army. 2,000 will be quite sufficient. And I will go down and escort him the rest of the way. Well, of course, he went down there and intercepted Edward. And rather than escort him safely to London, well, he escorted him safely, all right, but to the tower. Now, at the time, people weren't concerned because the tower was the traditional place where the prince 
went, or the king, before his coronation. You know, they had beautiful rooms there and it was the tradition for the sovereign to be, to be uh, housed in the tower. So no one was really that concerned about it at first. But then Richard went to... Uh, um, Oh, Elizabeth Woodville got a little bit concerned when she heard that her son had been intercepted and in, rather than be, you know, escorted fully, all of them, that they'd been taken, that um, Edward had been taken from his party because Lord Rivers, who was Elizabeth's brother, he was in Edward's party um, and he was arrested and it all got to be very concerning. So Elizabeth Woodville took the younger son, Richard, uh, by coincidence his name was Richard, uh, took Prince Richard, Richard to Westminster Abbey and claimed sanctuary there. And that's where she was waiting for Edward to come back to London. Anyway, so Richard, of course, had Edward in the tower. And then he went to Westminster Abbey to get Richard, the younger one. And Elizabeth Woodville, she really couldn't do anything because what could she do? The council had given Richard guardianship and so he took the younger boy uh, to the tower. And now he had them both under lock and key. Now, I think it's worth a moment thinking about Richard here because what was his fate? when he thought about it. He was the, la the closest claimer to the throne beyond these two boys uh, and, you know, that small family of the, the brother. And he must have sat there and thought, well, my fate is not going to be very good. What can I do to maximise my power? And maximising his power was to control the princes. In the same way as for Elizabeth Woodville, it was essential that she and her family have power over the princes. Anyway, so that's where that goes to. Now we're going to go across. Oh, well, I suppose I'd better. Uh, yes, I'll just. The long and the short of it is that the princes in the tower, as they were called, even though one was actually a king, he hadn't been crowned, but he was a king. Uh, the princes in the tower, um, they were seen playing in the afternoon on a summer's day and they weren't seen again. So it's all clouded with suspicion about what actually, how they met their end. They think they, for sure one did, uh, Apparently the older one, Edward, wasn't well anyway. And there's a chance, you know, that he wasn't going to make it for too long. And the younger one, there was all sorts of uh, theories that he actually did escape and get across to Europe. But they were dispelled, those uh, theories, mostly. But anyway, so now Richard basically declared himself king. And the council immediately ratified it. The... Parliament was more than happy to have him at that time because if it was sticking it to the Woodvilles that's what they'd be doing that's basically what it boiled down to right so now we're going to go across to the house of Lancaster to show you how Henry and Margaret Beaufort came into things now if you look here you'll find, again, descended from Edward III, but through the other side of the family. And what happened was, Henry the V, oh, well, I'll just put this, put this picture. I suppose I could just show you the uh, poor unfortunate boys in, in the tower. There's, there's, uh, this is by Sir John Everett Millet in 1878. And another one there. Paul Delaroche. 
painted that. And this rather sad one there by Pedro Americo. Right, anyway, back to the Lancaster house. You had a very famous king. Henry V, and he was the hero of Agincourt, where he took on an army over there with very small numbers and emerged victorious. So he was considered one of England's most popular king, uh, famed for leading uh, England to victory at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. Now, so you got him there, right? And there's his queen here who was Catherine of Val Valois. And what happened? She was the youngest child of Charles VI of France and Isabel of Bavaria. And you can see them here. Sorry. Henry V there and Catherine, okay? So they had uh, this guy, Henry VI. That's him. Okay. He was the on their only child. Now, after Henry V died, Catherine took up with Owen Tudor. And that was a bit of a scandal because Owen, he did great service to Henry V, but he was, he was knighted and that was it. He, he didn't really have any royalty to speak of. But he married Catherine de Valois, that's her second husband. And the Edmund and Jasper Tudor were the issue. Okay. So what happened was, um, uh, hang on a tick. This guy. Henry VI, he only had one child and it was a very sickly child. And he was really concerned that the dynasty would die. So he got Edmund Tudor to marry, uh, where is she? Margaret Beaufort. So you've got it over here. Okay, so what happened was, uh, Henry V and Catherine Valois had Henry VI. Then Henry VI married... I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Henry V married Catherine Valois and they had Henry VI. Now he only had one child and the child was sickly and he was worried that the dynasty would finish with him. So what he did was, when Henry V died, Catherine Valois married Sir Owen Tudor, who wasn't royal. He was just someone that distinguished himself in service to Henry V. Uh, so, you know, it was considered that she married beneath herself. But anyway, so what happened? These two, Edmund and Jasper, were half-brothers then to Henry VI, because they both had the same mother. And Henry VI wanted the dynasty to continue. So he got Edmund to marry Margaret Beaufort, who comes into the story there. Now, Margaret, again, descended through the line from Catherine Swinford. So she came through there. So there was royal blood in her. She came through from, from, from that line. As you can see, it's a very complex family tree. <laughs> anyway, suffice it to say that Margaret Beaufort and Edmund Tudor married. Now, Margaret was only 12 when she married Edmund, and he was 24. Um, but they lived as husband and wife, and she did fall pregnant. And Edmund, she, she 
actually loved him by the sounds of it because she always referred to him in a very loving way. Um, now, when she was pregnant, Edmund was away fighting in one of their Wars of the Roses and he ended up being captured by the Yorkists and he died of plague and she was about seven months pregnant and she went to Pembroke Castle in Wales and lived with Jasper Tudor, her brother-in-law. He looked after, uh, Edmund's brother, uh, looked after her. So that went on, you know, things went fairly quietly um, and it was okay while Edward IV was on the throne because nothing could be done. I mean, there was a bit of a rebellion and Ed Henry VI was taken prisoner and he was killed in the tower. So then Edward was the monarch. And because of that, um, it was okay. But then when Edward IV died, it all kicked off because uh, apart from Richard, who was now king, Henry, the son of Margaret Beaufort and Edmund Tudor, they, you know, that was the baby that was born. She, uh, they said there was an unbreakable bond born between mother and son when that baby was born in Pembroke Castle, when her husband had died in a battle. And she was only 12. She never had any more. She, I think she was just 13. And she never had any more children. Um, so anyway, there was concern then of hers uh, for the safety of her son. So Jasper and uh, uh, beg your pardon, Henry, her son, they went over to Brittany. And he was in exile over there until he was 28. She used to write letters to him and they kept up communication. And all the time that Henry was over there in Brittany in exile, she quietly worked her way in to the court of Edward IV. Uh, well, before Edward died, she was already in at court because she married again after Edmund Tudor died and she'd had the baby and the baby and Jasper went across. She worked her way into the court of Edward uh, before he died by marrying Thomas Stanley. And Thomas Stanley was a very high aristocrat in Edward's court. And so she was quietly working in the scenes and they said she, she worked in the shadows. And it's interesting because later on, her character shows that she's far from like that as a person. She always, early on anyway, and through much of her life, uh, before her own son became king, she presented as someone that was, you scarcely noticed she was there. But all the time, she was quietly working away to bring about the circumstances where she could bring her son back from exile and maybe make him king. So she was always quietly, you know, she was a lady in waiting, but never too groveling. She was always managed to keep her position uh, of, of respect from people. They said that she was a very devout person. Anyway, I've got some pictures here to show you of her very shortly. I hope this is holding together for you because it really is quite difficult to, to do it. But anyway, there's ja a picture of Jasper Tudor, who was a wonderful uncle to Henry while they were overseas, the Earl of Pembroke. Um, and this is a picture of Margaret, of, uh, yes, Margaret Beaufort, Countess of Richmond and Derby. Um, now she was, uh, as I say, she helped Elizabeth Woodville with things and all that sort of thing, but she wasn't ever too groveling. Uh, that wasn't her style. And this is the only picture we have really of Edmund Tudor. There he is. 
And it's funny actually because I did the stitching once and it sort of looks a little bit, not that it looks like him, but that outfit looks sort of similar. I copied it from somewhere and I can't find where I copied it from, but anyway. So I'll put Edmund there for the moment. And here's a picture of Pembroke Castle where Henry was born. Um, yes. Okay. And here is Henry. This picture, this is of course when he's older, but this picture was apparently uh, sent overseas as a possible marriage proposal but you know, never came off. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Right, now I'll just have a quick look to get us up to date here. Oh, well, see, there's an example of all the Woodvilles. 13 children, just about. Uh, so there were plenty of noses out of joint at the court. Now, I'm just going through here. And I'll pull them all together. Right. So, to jump forward, we now have Margaret Beaufort at court. We have Elizabeth Woodville after Richard took the throne. She was pretty much kept in isolate, well, in prison, but it was, wasn't a prison. It was a place where she couldn't really go anywhere. But, um, so she was kept in relative comfort as Queen Consort uh, to uh, Elizabeth of York, her first daughter, who really, today, she would have been the heir because she was the eldest and the boys were after her. But of course, in those times, it was the boys that took precedence over her. So what came about was a plot formed between the two mothers that is, a plot between Margaret Beaufort, mother of Henry, and Henry Lancaster, side, and Elizabeth Woodville, mother of Elizabeth of York, on the York side. And of course, Richard was always, he was very wary of these two women, and he always made sure that they didn't have any contact with each other. But what he forgot was that they both shared the same physician and he was Lewis Carleon. It's C-A-E-R-L-O-N. He was a mathematician, astronomer, astrologer and physician. And he actually went and visited both women. And in his bag one day, when he went to Elizabeth Woodville, was a document from Margaret Beaufort suggesting that the two children be brought together in marriage and for Richard to be deposed. Now this was highly risky stuff as you can imagine uh, but the two women decided that that's what they wanted. So what happened then was Richard decided that he was a bit concerned about Henry sitting over there in Brittany so he sent to the French uh, to the sorry to the Brit Brit Brittany uh, Duke or whoever was running the place he wanted him uh, Henry delivered back to England and Henry realised that his days were numbered so he went over to France and the King of France agreed to help him to provide money for his motley crew of supporters he had a lot of Lancastrian supporters over there and some mercenaries and they landed in Milford Haven in Wales. And Henry with his uncle Jasper, they then marched towards the Stanleys 
who the Stanleys were related to Margaret Beaufort, of course, the Stan uh, Thomas being her husband. And Richard was gall coming after them with his army. So Henry had no choice but to turn and fight, is what they say. And that's what he did do. And no one really gave him much hope on the day. They thought that Richard would just steamroll over the top of him. But as it turned out, at the Battle of Bosworth Field, uh, Henry won. He emerged victorious. And Sir William Stanley, not Thomas, uh, Margaret's husband, but the brother of Margaret's husband, put the crown on Richard's head. Uh, on Henry's head um, and he was Henry the seventh now Richard very bravely fought that day at the battle and I do have a little bit here about it um, here's the actual map of Henry Tudor arriving in Milford Haven and he was marching towards Bosworth. Uh, well, not towards there, but towards the Stanleys and intercepted. And that's when the battle happened anyway. So uh, what have we got here? It's a few bits and pieces. The comment of a contemporary, John Rouse, is the best epitaph on Richard's death as a soldier. If I may speak the truth to his honour, although small of body and weak in strength, he most valiantly defended himself as a noble knight to his last breath, often exclaiming that he was betrayed. Well, he was betrayed because... <laughs> The Stanleys really should have been in there on his side because they were at court with him and everything. But of course, as soon as, and they were hedging their bets because they didn't want to be on the losing side. But they ended up piling in on the side of Henry the Seventh, and I mean, what was their fate going to be anyway if they didn't win? And here is the um, Henry Tudor on this side. That's the the armor that they wore on the day. And the horse is all decked out. It must have been very heavy for the horses. And that was the boar. That was Richard's symbol. And of course, he was unhorsed. And you remember the Shakespeare? A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Well, that was uh, because of his deformity that he had. He could not fight. He didn't have the range of movement on the ground that he had on his horse. On his horse, he was the equal of anyone. But, of course, that was through no fault of his own. Uh, that was his uh, weakness. And then the other one, now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer. Well, the discontent, his winter of discontent, was that he believed that all of Edward's issue, his sons and his daughters, were all illegitimate and a, uh, a priest did come forward and say that he'd already married Edward IV to someone else. Um, so Richard probably was right. So, and when it says our discontent, he's using the royal hour like the royal we, we are not pleased and that kind of thing. But he's saying our discontent, my discontent is made glorious summer when he became king. But unfortunately for him, there were too many people, even for the times, that were very concerned about those princes just disappearing the way they did. And he, Richard was certainly implicated in their disappearance. But they never really had any proof that it was him. I mean, he could have ordered it. Um, and the other side of it, it tr is, tr too, that it was just as much in Henry the Seventh's 
interest that those princes be done away with as well, because he couldn't have been king if they'd have lived. So who knows the intrigues that were going on, because of course, if you wanted to blame anyone for their deaths, Richard was the perfect person to blame. And I did see in some of something somewhere where an attorney from America, a very high ranking one, said he could have got Richard off if, if there'd been a trial. And you had this shadowy figure here. This is the Duke of Buckingham. And he was Richard's enforcer. And he was supposedly loyal to Richard. And, but, um, and was under, under a shadow that maybe he'd killed the princes in the tower. And, but he swapped loyalty. And he was working for the York, uh, for the um, Lancaster side at some stage. So you really don't know. I mean, there were a few people that, who knows, who knows what happened 500 years ago before. I mean, even today, you know, you get stories about what's happened with the internet and everything else, and you still aren't quite sure what really has happened. Um, right, now, is there anything else I have here? Now, after Henry VII became king, there was the problem of two mothers at the court, the mother-in-law, because of course he did marry Elizabeth of York. I have a picture here somewhere. There she is, Elizabeth of York. And when she married Henry, he was clever enough to join the two houses in his own symbol. Notice how the white rose of York is much smaller than the red rose of Lancaster, even though the white rose is more royalty in it than he did, but anyway. And of course the back is sort of reminiscent of the Margaret Beaufort, the Beaufort portcullis that was brought to the household as well, to the symbols. And after his court started, and you had Elizabeth uh, Woodville there, you had Elizabeth of York there, her daughter, who was married to Henry, and then you had Henry's mother, Margaret of Beaufort, who was quite formidable. And this is when this supposedly quiet, demure and devout person started to throw a weight around a little bit. She would only walk one pace behind Elizabeth of York in court. She wore exactly the same quality of garment. <laughs> I'm wearing the royal blue today. <laughs> and um, I think Henry started to get a bit... He, he was devoted to his mother and she was my lady, the king's mother, is how she was referred because they couldn't call her queen but she was queen in everything but name um, now what happened was I think supposedly Margaret Beaufort insisted that Elizabeth Woodville be sent somewhere else away from court she did end up going to Bermondsey she went to a nunnery there uh, and protested very loudly all the way there and probably all the time she was there. But it was probably Henry. He probably just got jack of these two women uh, just carping quietly at each other and trying to, you know, get one up on each other. And for a bit of peace for his wife, because it must have been very difficult for Elizabeth of York to be putting up with all this. He thought it was better that she, Elizabeth, her mother, was away from court. And Margaret then decided that it was time for her to take a vow of chastity 
and to go and live away from court as well. You know, once she'd... I think she used to visit court and everything and come for special occasions. But I think she'd just had enough of her... She, she'd done what she wanted. She'd achieved what she wanted through, against all odds. Um, and through strength of courage and, and you know, tenacity to purpose, that you know, when you consider the life she must have had. Um, anyway... <clears throat> Excuse me. In 1499, with her husband's permission, she took a vow of chastity. And this was unusual, but not unprecedented, apparently. And she had rooms where she went that he used to visit her quite regularly. As the king's mother, she had legal and social independence, which other married women did not. Her son's first parliament recognised her right to hold property independent from her husband. That's property, yeah as if she were not married. Towards the end of her son's reign, she was given a special commission to administer justice in the north of England. Um, now, that isn't a shrinking violet, is it? Someone who sits in the shadows. She was quite happy to go up there and, you know, dispense justice. So, um, what else have we got here? Oh, and his signature. She used to write Margaret or M. Richmond, but then the, the Richmond was shortened down to Margaret R. And a lot of people said it was like she was writing Margaret Regina, as though she was queen. Um, and I'm thinking of calling this one, this video, Two Queens That Checkmated a King, because they checkmated Richard III, well and truly, the pair of them. Uh, but strictly speaking, she wasn't a queen, but in practice, she sort of was. <laughs> Um, she also included the Tudor crown and caption on her coat. Oh, I don't know. Oh, oh yes, Ab above her, her name, she she put uh, the Tudor crown and everything. Uh, historians believe that the departure from court of Dowager Queen Elizabeth Woodville in 1487 was partly at the behest of Henry's influential mother, but there is some doubt about this theory. Um, the, uh, now, she outlived her son Henry, but only by a couple of months. Uh, but she arranged his funeral and everything and was given precedence over everyone at the funeral. Um, she built a free school for the general public at Wimborne, Dorset. Uh, when she died in 1509, Wimborne Grammar School, now Queen Elizabeth's School, came into existence. In 1502, she established Lady Margaret's Professorship of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. And in 1505, she found refounded and enlarged God's House, Cambridge, as Christ's College, Cambridge, with a royal charter from the King. She has been honoured ever since as the foundress of the college. Uh, she died in the deanery of Westminster Abbey on the 29th of June, 1509, the day after her grandson Henry's 18th birthday, and just over two months after the death of his son. So, quite a remarkable woman. And, as you can see, I've got sheafs of paper here, but I can't, uh, I really can't cover it all. And I've probably left bits out. I'm sorry if it's been a bit confusing. But it, it really, you know, when you're in a time when things were seesawing from one side to the other, um... And when Henry landed at Milford Haven, he went down on his knees and said, Judge me, O Lord, and favour my cause. Now, I've got some pictures here just to finish up with. Oh, and I'm going to do a final little bit on Richard III because, uh, as probably quite a few of you know, his skeletal remains were found in uh, 2012 
uh, in a car park. So I'm just going to read that little bit about that to you and his burial service. But I just want to go through these pictures here in this book here that I've got, uh, which is Neville Williams, The Life and Times of Henry VII. And here's the Tudor version of Richard III. And I think that's what the Ricardians, as I think they call themselves, the supporters of Richard, they say, we've only got the Tudor version of what happened. Uh, so it was in their interest to demonise Richard. And when you think about it, again, you know, when I was talking about Henry in one of my videos, Henry VIII, you can see there the importance of having a male heir and what happens if you don't ensure the line of succession uh, to the point where if you don't have a clear line that's when all the trouble starts that's what I'm trying to say and this Henry was well aware of that and of the fact that his father's line really wasn't royal it just came down through the mother's side so he was on thin ice dynastically. Um, this one here is an effigy of Elizabeth of York. So you can see she was a beauty. Not surprisingly, because she had dazzling parents, didn't she? I mean, Edward IV was the tallest king uh, and wore all the finery and everything. And of course, Elizabeth Woodville was an absolute stunner. So it's not surprising that the daughter was so beautiful. And of course, it's interesting, history but repeated itself because Edward IV, uh, Henry VIII's grandfather, he swaggered about the court and all his finery and everything, and he insisted on marrying someone, a commoner. And Anne Boleyn was pretty much a commoner. But then again, Elizabeth came from that, so Elizabeth I, so... That was a good thing, really. And there is Margaret Beaufort at her prayers. Now, here's where the playing card comes in. Because they say that the playing card is Elizabeth. Do you see a resemblance there? Elizabeth of York is supposed to be who the playing card is depicted from. And there was Arthur, Prince of Wales. That was the Arthur that died young. Elizabeth of York and Henry VII's first child and they insisted on calling him Arthur after the legendary King Arthur. And that's a very young Catherine of Aragon that was married to him for such a short time. And of course they were devastated when that happened. But they did have Henry. And this one here is called Perkin Warbeck. And he was the pretender that said he was Richard's younger brother and had escaped from the tower and he caused Henry VII a lot of trouble in his reign uh, because there were plenty of supporters and one of them was William Stanley supposedly it was never actually definite but William Stanley was accused and even Thomas Stanley his brother the husband of Henry's mother couldn't save William. William was taken to the tower and killed and Henry the seventh conveniently inherited all of his lands and they were vast lands so that was probably more for getting the land than anything else because Henry found the French kings had a lot of power because they had a lot of land but the English kings didn't have a lot of land compared to the nobles so he set about writing that and I think 
probably William Stanley was one of the uh, victims of that. Um, there's Prince Arthur's tomb in Worcester Cathedral. He was taken there for burial. And oh, just a final picture here of the widower, Henry the Seventh, when his when Elizabeth of York died. Now he was devastated. Because he wasn't a demonstrative king. They said he was quite parsimonious. He was always counting his pennies and everything. But he loved her. And she probably saw him as a bit of a keeper. You know, he might, might have been a man of few words and not very demonstrative. But she was confident in the knowledge that he loved her. And that was probably more important than anything else. Right, so a last little bit here about Richard III. Youngest son of Richard, Duke of York and Cecily Neville, born 1452. And he was recently buried at Leicester Cathedral. Um, now, he was killed in battle and lost for 500 years. What happened was he was stripped naked and thrown over the back of a horse and somebody took him away. And they were never quite sure. But then in a little abbey in Leicester somewhere, there was always a rumour that there was a person of great note buried somewhere on the Priory grounds. So Philippa Langley uh, took it upon herself, she's a historian, to see if she could find where this Priory was and roughly where the burial area was to see if she could find Richard's tomb. And of course, the chances of finding that, as someone already said, was one in a million. And they were given 1% of the area to search. And it happened to be a car park in Leicester with the actual car park space. It was marked with an R just by coincidence. And the very first trench that they put the bulldozer in, they found bones. And would you believe it, they were Richard. They noticed the characteristic scoliosis of his spine. And of course, they were all tremendously excited. But they had to make sure with DNA, which they did do. And it was proved that it was him. So then came the... Uh, important task of putting the king where he needed to be. So I've got some notes here. Uh, I have done that a little bit. There was a dawn vigil with men dressed in armour of the time where Richard fell in battle. I've got a picture here somewhere. seems to have gone missing but anyway uh, the boss soil was collected from three significant places of Richard's life Fotheringay where he was born Middleham where he was trained as a warrior and leader and Bosworth where he was slain and there was a service first at Fotheringay to commemorate the battle and the three collections of soil were placed in a small casket to be sprinkled on Richard's casket when his skeleton was entombed at the cathedral. The present Duke of Gloucester was present and then Richard's casket was taken to Bosworth Field where he fell in battle. So they took it there on the back of a medieval wagon. There were 2,000 people there to witness the occasion and when the wagon left with the coffin on it from Bosworth and went on into Leicester, there were thousands of people on either side of the road and they, they threw white roses onto his coffin. Um, it was, and then a beacon was lit at Bosworth until he was finally interred and then it was put out. Um, a service of Compline took place and he, his 
um, he lay in repose for three days and over 20,000 members of the public went to view the coffin and pay their respects to him. And the Royal Army Medical Corps Association, um, they were the honour guard for his coffin, you know, just to protect the coffin while people were filing past. And then the Archbishop of Canterbury said prayers as the medieval king was laid to rest and he read them from Richard's own prayer book said to be found in Richard's tent at Bosworth. A discovery was made a few months prior to finding Richard's skeleton of a royal reburial service from medieval times and so this was used as a plan for a service fit for the burial of a medieval king with honour and respect. They had hymns, the Lord's Prayer was recited and a reading by the Duke of Gloucester today because of course uh, Richard was Duke of Gloucester. Um, and then the Reverend Tim Stevens said, they have come here in their tens of thousands from around the world to this ancient place of prayer, not to judge, condemn or praise, but to stand in silent, humble and reverent attentiveness. Then he said, today, we come to accord this king, this child of God, and these mortal remains, the dignity and honour denied them in death. This young king, who bore his disability with courage and know, knew the pain of bereavement close to his heart, because of course his father was killed when he was about seven or eight. A baptised Christian whose lot it was to live and die at a turning point in our history. And then the choir sang, um, and when the coffin was lowered in by the soldiers, it was blessed with holy water and everything. And an incense was wafted over, and the Archbishop of Canterbury said, as we return the bones of your servant King Richard to the grave, we beseech you to grant him a peaceful and quiet resting place. And on the coffin was 15... 1452 to 1485 um, and then finally a 3.5 ton piece of Yorkshire rock was placed over the tomb it was Swaledale fossil stone made of lots of little crinoid fossils to go over the top of his tomb which is now in Leicester Cathedral the last Plantagenet king and of course, his demise. And here's, we visited Bosworth Field, and the day we did, there's where Richard fell um, in battle, and someone had put some flowers there. So again, it's it's the sort of thing where someone is demonised from a place that we are today looking back in those days having said that as i said before people were horrified at the time when those children disappeared because they were children but you know against the times who knows we, we'll never really know what happened uh, much of it is is theory anyway um, and he was a king regardless of what he did or didn't do and it's quite remarkable and astonishing that he was found and that now he is in his proper place. And, you know, the women that arranged for his demise are also to be recognised for their role in history. Uh, I think there are some mini-series and things about the White Queen and all this and you know, I think from what I've read, they emphasise or exaggerate, shall we say, the scrapping between the two of them. <laughs> but reality was probably a long way from that, because really, at court, there were certain levels of behaviour. And however you felt about someone else, you couldn't just openly do it. Things didn't happen that way. And we're never going to happen that way. <laughs> anyway... I probably have left out things that I was going to tell you 
Um, I hope that it held together reasonably well. Um, and it wasn't, you know, as I say, it was quite a difficult area to cover because there was just so much. And I have to, at this point, uh, pay tribute to my husband for his hard work on the family tree. It took him quite some time to get into, into a legible way of looking at it that it looked more logical because much of the family tree, the way it is in the books, it makes your eyes just glaze over. And he's just been such a great assistant to me in putting this together. So um, I will say goodbye for now. Thank you very much for your company if you've lasted this long. I think my throat's just about to give out. <laughs> well, it serves me right, I did it to myself. <laughs> and uh, I will be doing Eleanor of Aquitaine uh, in, you know, not too far away. But of course, stitching is always the priority in my life. So I have to fit all this around my stitching and uh, all that stitchy bug. It never seems to leave me. I mean, it leaves some people, but it doesn't leave me. It just sits there with a vengeance the whole time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so until next time, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from Stitch Bliss Corner and happy stitching to everybody. Bye.